Good evening. My name is Paul Burnell. I'm the president of the Mention Bar Historical Society of Santa Clara County. We're happy that you're all here. And, uh, thank you, Judge. And uh, we'd like to welcome you to our fifth annual Then and Now Dinner. Before we begin, uh, I thought we should have a toast to Judge Bob Beersford, who could not be here tonight. He's not feeling well. But we're going to videotape this and send it to him. So here's to Judge Beersford. Yeah. And our Master of Ceremonies for tonight is Judge Nelson, and I will leave it for him. <laughs> City, you know, things were a little bit corrupt. They had more houses of prostitution than they did churches. Uh, the justice system was sort of shaky, and Judge Goodwin was sort of shaky as well. <laughs> and so he went out on the bench that morning to start this civil case involving these mining claims, and he said, I'd like you to know that last week, I received a check from the plaintiff personally for $10,000. And then he said a few days later, I received a check from the defendant personally for $15,000. So he said I was rather perplexed. I, I just didn't know what to do. But he said I have it resolved. He said I returned. 5,000 to the defendant, and now we'll try the case on its merits. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Beaford, very briefly, went to high school in El Cerrito, uh, <clears throat> graduated from San Jose State in 1960, from law school at the University of Utah, Utah College of Law in 64, some 85 members in that graduate in the class. He practiced law in Gilroy, starting in 65 with Byers and Bruce Jacobs, and elected to replace John Clarich as Justice Court Judge of the Gilroy Morgan Hill Court. And then in 19, that was in 1974, and then he became a Muni Court Judge on January 1st of 1977. He was appointed Judge of the Superior Court in December of 83, and he's still very active in Stone on the Bench, appointed by the Duke. So let me introduce John. Good evening. My uh, my my brother John couldn't be here, so he asked me to step in and step. I'm really honored to to be the first uh, speaker of this, uh, this uh, very honorable and auspicious group of judges. Um, I had the distinction of appearing as a lawyer before each and every one of these people. 
and uh, I, uh, I'm not going to say that was a pleasant experience, but it was a, it was a memorable one. I was um, the last justice court judge of this county. Um, as, as Judge Nelson indicated, I was elected uh, as judge of the justice court in, in um, Gilroy Morgan Hill Judicial District on June 4th, 1974, over 18 years ago now. Um, I was thinking about this the other day and looking at the roster of judges in our county, and presently there is only one sitting judge in this county who has been a judge longer than I have, and that's Judge Terry. I have been in service as either a justice court judge or municipal or superior court judge longer than any sitting judge than Judge Terry. I don't know, that's kind of scary when I think about that, but I'm still a little bit away from retirement. In any event, the Gilroy Morgan Hill Judicial District has kind of an interesting history to it. This district was formed when a judge by the name of Ed Fellows, who used to be the Justice Court Judge at Morgan Hill, was killed. And if history, if I remember is correct, I think some of you old timers will remember, I think he was killed crossing a railroad track. Isn't that right? I think that's right. right. And um, at that time, John Clarich was the, was the Justice Court Judge in Gilroy. John was elected to that seat in 1958. John, as many of you know, was star football player up in Santa Clara and went to the law school there and <clears throat> went down south to Gilroy and took up practice at that time with Sidney Johnson. Sidney, uh, well, when I was practicing law, I think Sidney had been a lawyer some 50 years at that time, but uh, John started practice with him in Gilroy and when Leon Thomas, the old Justice Court judge, the lay judge in Gilroy, retired, after 30 years in service, um, the seat became vacant, and John ran for that seat and was elected in 1958. One of his opponents was one of my old partners, Bruce Jacobs, at that time. But in any event, when Judge Fellows died, the Board of Supervisors then consolidated the Gilroy District, Judicial District, with the Morgan Hill District and formed the Gilroy Morgan Hill Judicial District. That district uh, encompassed all of the territory south of Coyote except the scales and a strip <laughs> down, Mono down Monterey Highway to Madrone. The city of San Jose was very smart to include the scales in its judicial district because that's where all the money was made on the overweights on the truckers going through Coyote. <laughs> and yeah, those, those overweight tickets were mandatory. The judge had no discretion to suspend any part of it. So that was a real money maker and, and um, so the city had a lot of foresight in making sure that that was in the old San Jose Milpitas Alviso. Did I get that straight? I think San Jose Alviso Milpitas Judicial District skills were involved in that district. But I had everything, everything south of Coyote, except for that strip of Monterey Highway and about 100 yards on either side of it. I had everything from that point all the way down to San Benito County, all the way over to Merced County, and all the way over to Santa Cruz County. So we had everything. We had fishing game violations. We had, um, uh, you name it, uh, trespassing, cattle rustling, cockfighting. It was just a real menagerie of, of cases you never knew what was going to happen. I had kind of like an informal agreement with the Highway Patrol that um, if they were ever chasing a speeder or a suspected drunk driver near one of the county lines, uh, that I would appreciate it if they just went a little further. <laughs> and uh, made the stop over in San Benito County or Merced County. <clears throat> uh, they uh, tried to accommodate me as much as they could. 
1973, this the vacancy occurred in the Gilroy Morgan Hill Judicial District because of the resignation of John, John Clarich, who was the incumbent at that time. And there was a decision that the Board of Supervisors had to make as to what to do with that judicial district. They could do a couple of things. They could have merged it with the San Jose district, which is, I think, what some of the some of the supervisors wanted to do. Or they could have uh, let it go by uh, a, a special election to be held the following June to let, let the seat be filled by election. Yeah, the board had indicated that it had opted to let the seat be uh, Actually, first of all, they wanted the seat to be merged with the San Jose Judicial District, the old San Jose El Piso, El Pitas District. Well, we had a friend on the board, and his name was Sig Sanchez, and as many of you know, he lived down in South County. And it seemed as how a bunch of the lawyers got together one morning in one of the pancake houses in Gilroy and invited Sig to breakfast. And I at that time, I was president of the South County Bar Association. I had absolutely no inclination to run for judge whatsoever. I had no desire to do that. I had a good practice. I was happy. Uh, I, things were great. And so anyway, we had a little chat down there with Sig, and some of the guys I felt were going to run uh, for, the, for the seat uh, had indicated to Sig that they wanted a chance to fill the seat themselves. And so he persuaded the other members of the board, and I think that they I think deferred to his district, and 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 the board then let that seat go by a special election to be held in conjunction with the the election, the primary election following June 1974. And so that's what occurred. In the meantime, from November to June, the seat was filled by a variety of uh, appointments and assignments from the judicial council. So we were doing. <coughs> Assignments from lay judges from Traspitos, uh, from San, uh, San Juan Batista, um, from Castroville, um, from Jackson up in, uh, in, in the Motherlode. In any event, those fellows were all lay judges, which were subsequently, as you might remember, um, not eligible to be justice court judges after 1975 because there was a case out of Yuba County called Gordon versus Justice Court, which indicated that all judges of any court must be attorneys of law. So that, that was the death knell for that, that type of historical significance. In 1974, there was a real flurry of activity to fill that Justice Court seat because the population of South County was approaching the 40,000 um, mark, which was the constitutional requirement for creation of a separate judicial district. The Constitution says at that time, I think it's still worded that way, if, if, if there is in the county a, a, a judicial district which has 40,000 people, then that judicial district is entitled to be a municipal court district. Well, we were so close to becoming a municipal court that there was a whole bunch of people running for that office. Myself, not included originally. I had no interest in running for that seat. There were eight, originally there were seven, and I became the last person to file. I became the eighth person to file. There were eight attorneys running for the seat, um, all of whom lived in South County and were practicing attorneys, either in Gilroy, Morgan Hill, or San Jose, except one who lived in Sacramento, and he moved into Morgan Hill and took an apartment just to run. Um, and there was another one in San, San Jose who moved down just to run. But after the election, they recanted that position real quick and moved back to wherever they came from. But in any event, there were originally eight, and Francis Crawford was one of the original eight. He dropped out. I was the last to file. I didn't think that I really wanted to do that, but I was persuaded to do so by some friends and <clears throat> people who indicated that if I had to run, if I was going to run, that they would help me get the necessary fees and funds and so forth to, to mount a campaign. And my recollection is the total campaign was, I think, $8,000.
and uh, $75 came out of my own pocket. But uh, the election was held on June 4, 1974, and I, I won the election. It was a winner-take-all thing. It wasn't a majority or anything like that. It was whoever, it wasn't 51%. It was whoever got the most votes won, because that was a special election. And I got 25% of the vote at that time. But then I faced the prospect of having run it again in two more years because I was only filling a, an unexpired term of the, of the previous occupant. <clears throat> At that time, I think the reason why so many people ran because everyone was interested in this municipal court seat. We were so very close to becoming a municipal court and everyone knew at that time that the municipal court judges were getting about $32,000 a year. I think that's what they were getting, something like that. Um, the Justice Court paid about a, about a third of that, or maybe a little more than a third, around $20,000, not, not quite that. Uh, maybe a little more than half, I think. It became necessary because I took a drop in pay to take the bench. I had to survive financially and it was impossible for me to, to start up a practice. But I didn't want to do that because I knew that in a few months would be municipal court, or within a year or two. I didn't want to do that, even though the law permitted the judge to practice as a justice court judge. So I, I enlisted the aid of my good friends in the San Jose Municipal Court, the friends like Ed Nelson and some of the other fellows who are up there. Uh, in, uh, good friend Ed Taylor out in Los Gatos and some of our friends down in Castroville and over in uh, Monterey County that if ever they needed uh, anyone to pinch hit while they're on vacation and so forth, I would be happy to help them out. And what happened was I, I filled all the rest of my time out by going around on assignments from the Judicial Council getting the salary of a municipal court judge. Um, so that worked out very well. But the the effort to make the judicial district a municipal court district was, was kind of lagging. It was slowing down. We weren't moving fast enough. So I remembered. I, I don't know how I remembered it, but I remembered one time I heard about a lawsuit being filed in Santa Clara Judicial District by force, not by force benzene, but at the time force benzene was then the justice court judge in Santa Clara. And then I remembered also that my good friend Dusty Rhodes had been, done something similar at the time that he was a justice court judge out in Los Gatos. And we devised a program that went something like this. We enlisted the, the assistance of Senator Al Alquis to introduce a bill in the legislature to create a municipal court district at the same time, we intended that if that didn't work, we were going to file a suit. Not me personally, you understand, because I couldn't do that, but there were folks who would do that sort of thing. Um, and we had a bona fide claim in excess of the jurisdiction of the Justice Court, within the jurisdiction of the Municipal Court, and that claim was going to be filed, a complaint to be filed, and obviously it would have been refused by the clerk of the Justice Court, and then a declaratory relief or mandamus proceeding could be brought in Superior Court. Much like as what happened up in Santa Clara. And I believe, Dusty, you can add your history as to that as to what you did, but I'm not sure. But the theory goes something like this, that upon reaching the Superior Court, evidence has to be presented to convince the court that the district is in fact a municipal court district because it has 40,000 people. So you present evidence by reason of phone listings and PG&E hookups and voters registration and a whole lot of other things. So the, the judge can then make a finding of fact that there is in fact 40,000 people in the district and so declare. And once the Superior Court so declares and that's a municipal court district, then, then all you need is the enabling legislation to create the district through the legislature. Well, that was the, the that was the approach we were taking, either a dual approach, either to file a suit or to move ahead with our independent legislation. 
Well, as as things would have, as, as luck would, would have it, uh, the the suit was not necessary because uh, Six Hatches, being the supervisor in South County, was very interested in the South County being serviced by a municipal court judge, and he he uh, enlisted the aid of Al, as I said, uh, to introduce the legislation. And at the same time, the bar association wanted a municipal court, so the bar association association was very instrumental in obtaining the necessary. Um, uh, evidence to be laid before the legislature so that we, we could create the municipal court district. That's exactly what happened. And the legislature found that there was the appropriate number of, of uh, inhabitants in the district, and the district was, was formed by creation of the legislature in 1966, effect, in 1976, effective January 1st, 1977. All I had to do was get myself reelected and I would have been automatically the municipal court judge. So in June of 1976, I ran for re-election, uh, and I expected all my former opponents to come right down and do the same. Well, uh, they didn't. Uh, I ran unopposed in that election, and I got elected. And as, as the law indicated, I succeeded myself as judge of the municipal court. I had to be appointed to the seat, though. The governor had to appoint me. Uh, governor Brown did it by appointment. Uh, it's a matter of, it's, it's, I don't think he could have escaped appointing me. But in any event, by law, I was the judge of the municipal court district. So that's how the Gilroy Morgan Hill became, the judicial district became a municipal court district. We were really riding high in 1977. We had shown that by reason of the fact that we could become a municipal court judge, we also had gone further and convinced Al Alquist that we should have a second judge by reason of the population we had. And so he introduced a bill to create a new judgeship, a separate seat, seat number two in the Gilroy Morgan Hill Municipal Court District. And at the same time, we had uh, capital funding from the board to create a new courthouse in San Martin, something you haven't even seen yet. But we had this courthouse drafted and designed in 1977. I still have the plans in my chambers, the downtown Superior Court. Um, Ed Taylor told me, before you will never see a new courthouse in your life on the bench. Why? Well, you know, he's He's getting pretty close to being prophetic, but the what happened was the board had approved the architect. The architect uh, had made the plans. The plans were approved. It was just about to go to contract. A little thing happened on the way to the contract called Prop 13. In 1978, Prop 13 was passed. Um, and at that time, the board didn't actually know what to do with Prop 13, so they scuttled all of the capital improvement plans, and in, in, that, in that action, the municipal court went down with it. Um, they also, at the same time, withdrew their approval for the second judgeship for the district, and so the legislature uh, pulled that back also. So there we were, back to the starting line. Well, the Board of Supervisors wasn't finished because they thereafter took upon themselves to begin consolidation of all the municipal court districts in Santa Clara County. And we had a real fun time there for a while. My good friend Ed Scoyan knows he was on this committee. Uh, Ed from the north, Beaufort from the south. We had to run through the cactus and the dead bodies and the skulls and the wagon oh, God, train. It was 200 miles. At, go least, to Palo Alto. at least 200 miles. No water. No, <laughs> no inhabitants between. Right, Ed? Right. Anyway, Ed was on the north. I was on the south. Ed Taylor on the west was invited, but Ed. My horse died on Coyote Creek. <laughs> Ed Taylor wouldn't have a thing to do with it. He just just as soon as it, the whole thing went away. Uh, Bill Brown from the Central Park came over. Let's see, Levy Terry from San Jose Muni, and Bill Harris from San Jose Muni. 
Am I leaving anybody out there? No. I think that's the committee that drafted the consolidation plan. The gang of six minus, minus one. Six minus one, yeah. Ed being the minus one. And I, I think he's still complaining about it. But I think that what we did, we saw the handwriting on the wall, and we did the best we could to create the district because it was going to come hell or high water. So we might as well form something that we can live with. And that was our attitude with it. And uh, none of us were very pleased with it because it meant a couple of significant things. First of all, it meant giving up autonomy. It meant giving up your own little turf, if you will. I was no longer the law south of Coyote. Um, it meant that you had to run for election countywide. And that was really scary. It was scary for me, uh, but uh, some of the, the, the guys downtown San Jose didn't think it was a big deal. But uh, I came from a judicial district that had like 16,000 registered voters. And I don't know if anybody up in San Jose knew who the hell I was at all. So it was pretty scary for me. But in any event, we worked that out the best we could. And of course, as they say, the rest is history. The board did consolidate. And the consolidation became effective July 1979. Shortly thereafter, I had the distinction of being appointed by, or assigned by my good friend Mark Thomas to the Morgan Hill Court, branch court of the municipal court at that time, to be the last judge to hear the last case in Morgan Hill. And I appreciate that, Mark. I still have that record, and I have that in my files. Um, but being a justice court judge was very interesting. It meant a lot of things. It meant, as I indicated, autonomy. There was a lot of efficiency involved in that process. For instance, I didn't have to meet with a committee. Um, I would, if I wanted to change the bail schedule, I just did it. Um, if I wanted to change the way a form read, I just did it. Uh, I just told my clerk, we're changing things. She said, fine. That was it. Uh, if I wanted to change the calendar, no problem. No one argued with me whatsoever. Um, we just made up things as we went along. It all kind of just, we had no rules. The only rules we had were the rules promulgated by the legislature and or judicial council. Was the local rules were mine. It was really kind of fun. <laughs> and and I, I worked it out, I worked it out with the Bar Association, and it was an efficient way to run a court. It wasn't the most fancy court, but it was an efficient court. We, uh, in Morgan Hill, we sat um, in a building that was one half of which was partitioned off by sheetrock. We were the northern half. The southern half was Lum's Chinese uh, kitchen, uh, <laughs> ch uh, Chinese restaurant. Southern half. And when my prisoners came from the from the county jail, the sheriff would bring them around, go down a back street, park on a side street, run them in daisy chain fashion, all chained together, past the back door of Lum's kitchen, past his garbage cans, into my back door, and up the hallway, past my chambers, and into the jury box. And they stayed chained together all day long. They, they never got uh, unhooked, except if somebody had to go to the bathroom, we'd unhook him, and the deputy run him up, then they'd run him back. The at, at first, we used to do everything up in Morgan Hill, because everyone was reluctant to, to join anything together down there. Morgan Hill was Morgan Hill, Gilroy was Gilroy. Morgan Hill had its own calendar, Gilroy had its own calendar. And I thought, boy, this was a really inefficient way to run this thing. Um, one time I had a jury trial in Morgan Hill, and the chambers were, oh, not much bigger than this podium, I think, but they were next to the jury room. The jury room was just the back room of this building, and it had bars on the, on the window, and it was also doubled as a storage uh, room. And between the jury room and my chambers, there was a wall heater, and of course, you know, you could see through the, the bottom of it, you could hear everything going on. When the jury was deliberating, I had to leave my chamber so I wouldn't hear what they were saying. But one day I was sitting, the jury had just retired, and and I was sitting in my chamber, and one of the fellows came out of the jury room because he wanted to go to the restroom, 
and we all used the same restroom. There's just one restroom in the back down the hallway. And he walked by my chamber and he says, God, bud, can't you get the Board of Supervisors to get a better jury room than this? And I said, well, you know, I thought about that, you know. He's probably correct. This is really not good justice. This is really not the way things should operate. Um, I persuaded the, the city of Morgan Hill and the people down there that we should probably just do traffic and small claims in the Morgan Hill Court and move the preliminary hearings and the jury trials down to the Gilroy Court. And they were happy with that arrangement because, as I indicated at that time, they were, they were anticipating that new municipal court being built in, in San Martin. And those people really deserve that court. As I understand now, they have room for probably four judges and a commissioner. And I'm not sure what they're going to do now with, with the state of the budget. But And I I don't know if, if that money's still on the table. And I don't know where they are in terms of their in terms of their contract. Uh, but I, I hope to God that they get it. They, they certainly need it and they deserve it. In any event. I could tell you a lot of war stories about about the Justice Court, about things that happened down there that I, I know we want to get on with the program. But one of uh, some of the best uh, times of my my life, some of the most fun times, memorable times were uh, when I served on the on the Justice Court and on the one one person municipal court. Uh, the Superior Court is interesting and fun, and the cases are bigger, and there's more zeros on the dollars and things like that. But when it comes to knock down, down home uh, justice, I, I think that the, the, the old justice courts of the state did a pretty good job, even though uh, by and large and at the beginning they were manned by, by lay judges. Uh, they did their thing, and uh, history will prove it out. Uh, it was a necessary, uh, necessary institution at the time, one that's come and gone, but it was sure fun to be part of it. Thank you very much. Judge Beaufort speaks about the money he made when he first became judge. <clears throat> when I first became judge, we got $10,000 a year. And he also mentioned the fact that he and Scoyne and Perry and Harris and Brown were so instrumental in consolidation. No, no. The supervisors consolidated. We implemented. <laughs> Point of order. What they did was they came around and talked to Ed Taylor and myself and said, "Be sure now and vote in favor of consolidation." And Ed Taylor and I were very, very opposed to it. And you know where we are now? Where are we? We're right back to where we were. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, and Joe said something about continuous service as a judge. Well, I've been a judge now, let's see, about 32 years and seven months. And when I say judge, um, about six years ago, as I was approaching 70, uh, I had to retire. <laughs> because otherwise my retirement would go down 50%. So I called Sacramento and I said, look, I, I, I'd like to retire, but on the other hand, I'd like to remain as a judge. And they said, all right, um, come December 1st, you, uh, you retire on a Friday night, effective as of 5 o'clock, and then we'll appoint you back to the bench on Monday morning at 9. Now, you won't get your retirement but you won't lose your retirement. So I haven't lost a day of work since I retired, <laughs> sitting there every day in Munich Court and enjoying it. Um, I'm reminded of a story that they tell about an attorney who represented a big time gangster back in Chicago. The attorney was very suave, very, very, very intelligent. And the attorney had a brother who was the accountant for this gangster. And the accountant was a deaf mute. 
and the only way that the gangster and the accountant could communicate was through the brother, the attorney, because he could do the sign language. And the accountant was, was one of the best. Well, it so happened that the gangster discovered that $300,000 in cash was missing from his safe deposit, his vault. So he called the accountant in and the attorney and said to the attorney, you tell your brother, I want to know where that goddamn money is. So the brother talks to the accountant, sign language, and the accountant replies. And the gangster says, all right, what did, what did he say? And the attorney brother says, he doesn't know anything about that $300,000. So the, the gangster takes out his gun, points it at the accountant, and says, now, to the attorney, you, you tell your brother that he better let me know now where that $300,000 is. Okay, they communicate back and forth. Nope, he doesn't know anything about it. So the gangster goes up to the accountant, puts the gun at his head, pulls back the trigger, and said to the attorney, now you tell your goddamn brother that if he doesn't tell me where that cash is, I'm going to blow his head off. So the attorney and the accountant communicate back and forth. And of course, the accountant's getting very nervous. So what the accountant told the brother in sign language is, I hid that $300,000 in your garage behind the workbench. <laughs> The attorney says to himself, oh, $300,000 in my garage, and nobody knows about it except my brother. <laughs> so the gangster says, God damn it, tell me what is he talking about? What did he say to you? And the attorney says, my brother said, you are no good son of a bitch, and you don't have the guts to pull the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Judge Fernandez, high school in Honolulu, and apparently when I talked to uh, Judge Fernandez the other day, he mentioned the fact that unfortunately he suffered some damage over there in Kauai, I hope not too much, and he graduated from Stanford in 53, Stanford Law School in 55, worked for the State Compensation Insurance Fund in San Francisco for about seven months and then practiced law in Centerville for about 14 and a half years, two and a half years with Joe Lewis and 12 years with Myron Sheriff. Uh, <clears throat> he was appointed to the Municipal Court by Reagan in 69, to the Superior Court of the County of Santa Clara by Reagan in 74, and he retired in July of 89. <clears throat> I remember Judge Fernandez when he was an attorney in Sunnyvale. And coincidentally, uh, Fernandez, Jim Scott, Jim DeVaris, Tom Ryan, Racanelli, and myself would get together periodically, by that I mean every couple of months, have a little poker game at Tom Ryan's house in Sunnyvale. And it's strange that all of those guys became a judge. Now you say, well, Ed, what, what, what's so great about that? They all became a judge. Or nothing except I think we were all very honest poker players, that's all. <laughs> you remember that, Bill, right? It's a lot of fun. We had a good time. In any event, here's Judge Fernandez. to all of you, as a, um, a, a this Easter time in the Holy City, there's an American couple's there, and they say, they're saying to themselves, this is wonderful, Easter in St. Peter's, all these throngs of people that are here, we would sure love to know what is the meaning of Easter. And at about that time, uh, Father Pietro comes by with his flock of little children that he's teaching. Uh, all the important things about uh, the 
Catholicism. So the couple goes out to Father Pietro and they say, now, Father, could you tell us what is the meaning of Easter? And the good father says, well, I can tell you what the meaning of Easter is, but let me have one of my children tell you what the meaning of Easter is. Luigi, can you tell this young couple, what is the meaning of Easter? Oh, sure, says Luigi, I can tell you. Easter. That's when everybody gets around the big table. And they bring out the turkey and the cranberry sauce. And Father Pietro says, no, 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 no. That's what and you tell us what is the meaning of Easter. Can you tell us? Yeah. And I said, oh, yes, I can tell you the meaning of Easter. Easter, that's the way everybody comes to the house. And they have the tree. And they put the lights on the tree. They put the presents under the tree. Ah, Father Pietro. No, no, that's right. That's right. Joseph. Can you tell us the meaning of Easter? Oh, sure, says Joseph. Easter. That's the one that the a pilot. He can tell my Jesus Christ to die. And then Jesus Christ, he go through the streets of the city with the cross. And then he take the cross, and then he put him up on the hill. And then they pretty soon they put the Christ up there, and then he pass away. And then they take him down, and they put him in the cloth, and they take him into the cave. And they push the rock up against the cave. And after three days, the Jesus Christ, he came out. And he pushes aside the rock, and he's sticking his head outside. But if he sees a shadow, <laughs> I just want to let you know I don't get my history right at all. I'm, I'm I came to Sunnyvale in uh, 1956. I don't have the, the, I really don't have the pleasure of being a Justice Court judge. So I have to tell you the stories uh, that I have from the perspective of a, of a lawyer watching the passing parade. But uh, Sunnyvale at the time I came there was about, it was 20,000 people and we had the Justice Court. And it was in the old city hall. And there was a library, the clerk's office, and the, uh, Peter Vaughn, greatest guy in the world, he used to try the cases in the afternoon. And the interesting thing about the cases were that, you know, you'd get up to, to old Peter and you'd, you'd bring your uh, innocent client and you'd say, you know, you know Charlie, you, you never was drunk in his life, but nothing like this could happen. And Peter would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know Charlie, he's been drunk, the day he was born, he was a drunk on the day he was arrested, he's going to be drunk tomorrow. But the good thing about uh, old Peter Vaughn, you could always rely on him. He was old tenant too. Ten dollar fine, two dollars penalty. Ten dollars fine, two dollars penalty. That, that was it. It was wonderful. Great guy. Uh, the, the, the thing that was interesting about trying cases over in the old justice court, it, it really was uh, the, the council chambers uh, for the city council in Sunnyvale. And, uh, we would periodically, and then of course the library was next door, and we'd periodically have either people coming in trying to return a library book, or somebody looking for the mayor to, to try and get, get some water bill fixed. The, uh, the, uh, the, there was a semi-official bar association in Sunnyville, and what I meant, mean by semi-official, it was more, more like a drinking club. And we, uh, we used to get together and we would invite the local judge to you know, participate in our festivities. Uh, unfortunately, Peter Bond passed away and the good Tom Ryan became the Justice Court judge and soon to be elevated to the Miss Court. Uh, but his participation in our activities ended uh, one night when uh, he, uh, he seemed to have fallen asleep on the couch of one of, they were having a party over at, a, at one of the um, members of the association's home. And seemed to fall asleep on, on the couch and somehow some of his uh, friends who were attorneys decided that it was time for him to go to the swimming pool so they took him and threw him up in, in the pool the only problem was Tom Ryan couldn't swim and he almost uh, drowned and that ended the uh, that really ended the, uh, the association of the local judiciary with uh, the parts of the <laughs> You know, we were young and foolish in those days. I mean, you know, respect for the bench was important, but after hours, <laughs> it was a little different. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Justice Court 
uh, somewhere around uh, 1960 uh, was going to become history. Sunnyville decided it was going to do some redevelopment. Actually, it was 1961, I think it was, that they were going to do some redevelopment and uh, knock down the building. So then they put the, what they did was they moved the uh, court, which, had, by the way, I'm sorry, it's a justice court. It, it, it had just recently become elevated to municipal court uh, with uh, DeVaris, who replaced uh, Tom Ryan, and then uh, uh, Tim Scott came in about that same, uh, sh about four years after. Uh, DeVaris uh, served a little bit of time in the uh, council chambers of the uh, city fathers. And if you know Jim DeVaris, I don't think he really liked that very much. Uh, but in any event, the, 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 the next event was uh, uh, Jim Scott gets appointed, and there's no court, to, no place for the court to be at, and we move it over. So the City Fathers moves it over to the Lucky Store, which is on uh, Fremont and uh, Sunnyville Saratoga Road, which is, which is quite wonderful. You know, they put up these little temporary uh, walls, and you can hear everything that's going on. It's just like the Terrain Street. You know what Terrain Street sounds like, but that's the way the uh, municipal court was in uh, Sunnyville at the Lucky Store. I always used to feel like I was at the checkout stand when they came in and paid parking tickets. Well, that's five dollars, that's seven dollars, and so forth. <laughs> and that was the feeling. Uh, but we were trying. The, the, the bar association was really trying very hard to uh, get a permanent home for the courthouse. The only trouble was that nobody could quite agree on where the location should be. There was tremendous wrangling between the city and the bar association and what the and the county. And the county of course uh, paid for the building the uh, city would provide the site. But in any event uh, the, the fighting got so uh, heavy duty between the bar and the, the various uh, political entities that eventually the council in exasperation said you're going to go out to the Murphy Estate. Well, the interesting thing about the Murphy Estate was it was right next to the railroad tracks, or right near the railroad tracks. And uh, it was almost impossible to get to it. However, the, uh, as one city councilman opined, it was wonderful, it had beautiful oak trees, the judges could sit under these beautiful oak trees and read their tomes of ancient lore and develop an awful lot of great jurisprudence while they were out at the Murphy Estate. Well, I happened to be on the city council at the time, and by the way, you have to know that the vote to move the, move the courthouse over to the, the, the site, the, the future site of the courthouse over the Murphy State was six to one. I was the one, and there were six against me. At any event, uh, they, all of the plans for the courthouse in Sunnyvale were approved. And it was the construction contract had been uh, worked out. It was about to be awarded. When, you know, here comes old uh, Councilman Fernandez and says, "Time to rethink. Time to rethink this." And this is really the like the like the, the last hour. Uh, they're, they're about to come up for the vote that night. And I can still remember that particular evening because there was a lynch mob out there to get me. I mean, the council chambers had about something like 300 people. Uh, there, uh, everyone uh, was saying, uh, you know, you're crazy. You're about, you know, got the tar and the feathers and the oil and everything boiling. I said, well, you know, I, uh, with, a, with, with a little bit of courage and uh, wearing my brown pants, I, I uh, uh, you know, I, I proposed that we really had to rethink this thing, and let's take a look at the map, see what the map show, shows. Well, you remember that song, Rosemary Clooney song, the railroad comes from the center of the house. The Central Expressway was going to go through half of the Sunnyvale Municipal Court. <laughs> okay. I don't know who planned this for the county, but that's the way it was going to be. So from being down on the bottom, that night I got five votes <laughs> and the, the Sunnyvale Municipal Court is where it is today, right at the right off the intersection of El Camino and uh, Matilda Avenue. Uh, the, the great thing about it was the, the judges got had the opportunity to design it, set it up just the way they wanted with little atriums and little coffee rooms and so forth, so that those of you who were privileged enough to come down to the old, uh, the new Sunnyvale Municipal Court, like Grand Armstrong, you know, we, we 
we had Mark Thomas, who was a judge uh, there, loved the country club. Because that was kind of the place, the end place to go. You worked from 9 to 12 or 1 and knocked off for the rest of the day. It was, it was a really, really good time. And I can remember, I think Ed, Ed remembers how you could run your own court. And so does Joe and I'm sure Dusty. It was, it was a great time. The, the days before consolidation where, you, where a judge was a judge and you, you were in charge of your municipality and you could, uh, if you worked hard, you, you could also play hard. There, there were really wonderful times with the good, old, the good old days prior to consolidation. I think it's your fault oh. it, that it happened. I really, really do. I'm going to blame you for it. I'll, I'll, I'll pick on Skoya. Uh, uh, and therefore, he can't be deciding. Oh, oh, oh. I have an already vote no. You? <laughs> I thought you left. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the, t the times, I would say, in the 50s and the 60s and even into the 70s were, I think, you know, the golden years of, of the justice courts and the municipal courts because you had a lot of wonderful, uh, wonderful characters that uh, seemed to populate it. Uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, characters, but, I mean, Ed was a, a celebrity, and, and the, 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 this guy, Nelson, was uh, you know like a hero to all of us because of his uh, great Santa Clara days, and I can you know still remember old dusty uh, crusty roads. Uh, you know, called I called him plain justice when I was was a lawyer, and you you just had some real wonderful people, and it was a kind of a time also when uh, everybody in the bar knew everybody else, and you could trust everybody that you dealt with, and uh, I, I guess you can never look back and say well the good old days. Uh, Bygone. Uh, I wish I wish a lot of those good old days were back with us uh, today. So thanks very much for giving me a chance to talk to you about the past. Speaking about the uh, <clears throat> the good old days. Uh, Judge Beaufort had mentioned Ed Fellows. Ed Fellows and I were very close friends. He was kind enough to have me try a few of his jury cases, and he and I were very well acquainted. And I was secretary treasurer of the Bar Association for some 10 years before I became judge, and that was without pay. But of course, you know, we had maybe when I took over as a secretary treasurer, probably. 250 attorneys in the entire county. And each year Ed Fellows would have a barbecue out at his ranch. He had a large cattle ranch out in the Calero Dam area. As a matter of fact, uh, Joe Beaufort said that Ed was killed in an accident, and he, and he was. Unfortunately, Ed would leave his Calero ranch uh, every morning about the same time. He liked to get to work early. He'd leave around 7 o'clock. And he'd always go down Bailey Avenue out to Monterey Road. And by force of habit, by the time he crossed the tracks there in Bailey Avenue, there was never a train in sight because he was always a half hour ahead of the train. On this particular morning, unfortunately, Ed had gotten almost halfway to the Monterey Road and had forgotten something. So he turned around and went back to his house took some 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, picked up the documents, whatever it was, came back on Bailey Avenue and was crossing the tracks. And, you know, by force of habit, he just, he, he just didn't think there would be a train there coming and didn't hear the train, didn't see the train, and unfortunately the train hit him and, and he was killed. Uh, but those years out there at his ranch, he had a old barn that we used to have the bar set up there. Uh, Jose used to go out there. And there there were some others of you, I'm sure, that were out there then, but this was quite some years ago. And we'd barbecue and play softball, and they'd go swimming out there, and there was a lot of drinking and uh, a lot of gambling, and just a lot of fun. And you knew everybody by their first names, you know, really. You knew everybody by their first names. And it was the type of a bar association that when I practiced law, um, if some of you had filed a complaint against a client of mine and he brought the complaint in, I'd pick up the phone and 
and say, uh, Rick, my client just brought in this complaint, you know, don't take it to fall, I'll get an answer in sooner or later. That's the way it was. That's the way it was, god damn it. I mean, when you when you call a man and he said, sure, I mean, you didn't abuse the privilege, you didn't sit on it for a few months, but uh, you didn't always get it in on time. And probably one of the deciding factors that make, made me decide to become a judge is when the interrogatories came into play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't do any more civil trials. I did that for many, many years, and I just do criminal work now over there. But what a waste of time that is. <laughs> now, some attorneys say, Judge, we need all that information, huh? Question 12. What color shoes were you wearing on the day of the accident? You know, I mean, you, you've been through this. I don't have to explain that. But uh, it was a different type of practice. And in criminal cases, uh, we didn't have Miranda. Uh, we didn't have discovery. And some people will say, well, you know, Judge, uh, maybe those weren't the good old days. Maybe, maybe you had people that were convicted of crimes that they didn't commit. I did a lot of criminal work. And I can say that those clients of mine that were convicted were guilty. <laughs> and those that were found innocent were innocent. Uh, no question about that in my mind. I, uh, but anyway, uh, I had an experience when I was an attorney. You know, you talk about embarrassing moments. I represented the San Jose, San Jose City Lines, and they had a number of accidents in those days. And we had a young girl who was going to Notre Dame High School, and she got off the bus at Second and Reed, right opposite the school. And as she stepped off, she claimed that she caught her heel in the doors in the back. So she sued, and uh, I defended for the bus company. And the chief engineer for the San Jose City Lines and the head mechanic said, uh, Nelson, there's no way, no way that that girl could get her heel caught in that, those doors, because the minute it hits something, it flies open. <laughs> okay. I want that bus out on the lot on a Saturday. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do some testing. They had the same bus. And I'm out there and tested it. And of course, in those days, the driver would open the back door the bus and then close it. And then supposedly, supposedly, if there was an object in between the door and it closed together, it would fly open. Well, I was out there for three hours with that son of a bitch and bus. <laughs> I did everything. My knee, my shoes, everything you can imagine. Fly right open. No problem. So I said, all right, bring the bus down to the courthouse. Judge Del Mula was a judge on the first floor in the Spirit Court. And just before I rested, I asked the judge for the privilege of having the jury come out back parking lot, I was going to conduct this experiment, and I told him what it was going to be. Fine, he agreed, so we went out there. <laughs> and I got on the bus, <laughs> and that bus driver opened that door, and I'm going to be brave now, see, instead of my knee or my shoe or something, I'm going to stick my head in between those two doors. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it opened, and when it closed, it stayed closed. <laughs> Put my head right in between the two guys at the end of it. I got all these jurors looking at me. <laughs> you, you've probably been to a carnival or a circus, and you see this guy with his head in a canvas and opening there and throwing baseballs at him. You know, that's exactly what I felt. My head in between these doors. And I can't get the goddamn doors open. <laughs> Seemed like eternity, but 
<laughs> the driver finally opened the doors and we went back into the courthouse and when it came to closing argument, Judge Ambulo said, uh, Mr. Nelson, are you going to argue? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> no closing argument. But fortunately, they only brought in the judge for $6,000, which, which, you know, I thought was peanuts, even in those days. And so I talked to one of the jurors afterwards, and I said, gee, you know, you're very considerate. $6,000 judgment. He said, well, to be quite honest about it, all the jurors felt very, very badly for you. <laughs> Thank God the plaintiff's attorney didn't hear that. Uh, all right, the next gentleman, Judge Rhodes, graduated from Clear Lake High School in Lakeport, California, 1940. 31 students in the graduating class. Graduated from Stanford University in 52. He had a couple of prominent graduating seniors with him. I'll let you mention their names. He joined the Wells Fargo Trust Department for a year and then started to practice law with Mordyke, Anderson, Evans, and Rhodes in Palo Alto. Judge Evans, by the way, was a former Superior Court judge. In 58, he ran for judgeship uh, in Los Gatos. I lived out there on Robin Lane in Los Gatos, and I had thoughts of also running for that office. But I had heard that Department 5 was going to be created in San Jose. So when I found out that Judge Rose was going to run, there's no way that I was going to take him on. Uh, and later I found out that when he ran for that job, he went to every house, every house, all those precincts out there and introduced himself and gained a whole lot of popularity and, and won the election. Eight candidates were opposing him. By nine months later, that became a municipal court judgeship. In 1967, he was appointed along with Paul Gallagher, who some of you remember by Governor Reagan, to the Superior Court, and he held office starting in January 68, up until he retired in April of 1983. Dusty Rhodes and I have been very close friends all these years, and it's an honor for me to introduce you. Come up, Dusty. Thank you. Thanks very much for those kind words, Ed. I will tell the audience who the two classmates of mine are, Bill Rehnquist and Sandy Day O'Connor. <laughs> on the big time Supreme Court. I heard a story the other night that you might enjoy. A couple threw a little cocktail party and the guests arrived and after a couple of hours or a little more, one of the guests became quite drunk. He'd been going out to the kitchen quite often to refill his glass. And at the, the time in question, he went out, got his glass refilled, and he was kind of stumbling back into the other part of the house. There was the hostess. And he said to her, he said, the lemons have legs? And she said, what? Do lemons have legs? No. Are you sure that lemons don't have legs? Of course I'm sure. Lemons don't have legs. Oh boy, I just squeezed your canary into my drink. <laughs> I thought I'd just very briefly go over with you a little of the history of the, what, what are referred to as inferior trial courts. That's a very poor word in my opinion. I think lower trial court sounds a lot better and a lot more accurate. There's nothing inferior, in my opinion, about the lower courts. They have a little less jurisdiction. 
cases aren't as big, but they, they're the courts who see the people. Most of the people come out for a traffic ticket or a small claim, and that's where American justice is performed. But anyway, in the late 40s, the leaders of the bench and bar in our state decided that something had to be done to reorganize the lower courts or trial courts of our state. I don't know how many of you remember, but there used to be township courts, city justices courts, class A, class B justice courts, police courts. In 1949, there were 768 courts which exercised jurisdiction inferior to that of the Superior Court in the state of California. Lots of them had concurrent and overlapping jurisdiction in a city. Out in Los Gatos, the Redwood Township, I don't know how many of you ever heard of that, but George Stepovich was the judge of the Redwood Township. Colonel Merrill, who was an attorney, Gene Merrill, the retired colonel, very nice gentleman, was the, was the Los Gatos Justice Court judge. Phil Gibson, who was the Supreme Court Justice, Chief Justice at that time, uh, led the fight to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot at the general election in 1950. And the idea was to do away with all of the inferior courts and replace them with two lower courts, a municipal court and a judicial district with 40,000 or more people, and a justice court in a district with less than 40,000 people. That passed, that constitutional amendment passed in November of 1950. It took a few years to implement because some of the judges could automatically move up or move into a different type of court, but so, since so many courts were being uh, dissolved, lots of runoffs had to take place. <clears throat> so the dust had settled completely though by the first uh, Monday in January of 1953. Because the election of 52, some, of, some in the primary and some in the general, depending on how many people were running and whether anybody got a majority of the votes in the, in the primary or not. Uh, in that election, of, of, uh, general election of 52, all of, the, all of the contests were resolved. And so the new system started in early 53. I was, I ran in, in 58 and became a judge in January of 59. My predecessor, Paul Crawford, was not an attorney licensed to practice in this state, but he had practiced for many years in, as an attorney in Leadville, Colorado. And he had been admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court. He was very proud of that, and I certainly don't blame him. But, uh, Everybody, I guess, knew that uh, in the election of uh, 1958, there were enough people out of that judicial district, the Los Gatos, Saratoga, Campbell Judicial District, which also included Monteserino and Monta Vista, all of the unincorporated area of the county up to the uh, Santa Cruz County line, all across high spread of the states. Chemiquita Park, all of those were in it, and actually the district went all the way down to the IBM plant on the old Downer Road, which was all in the county at that time. So it was a large, very large physical district, but the, and the population had been estimated at considerably more than 40,000. Judge Crawford was still going to seek re-election because he figured that by the time the municipal court came into being, he probably would be ready to retire. He was quite an old gentleman terrible health at the time. So uh, naturally the those of us who were thinking about running were kind of hoping he wouldn't seek re-election because the incumbents, you know, in those days did very well. 
this doctor helped us out a lot, helped the other candidates out a lot, and told him he could not run for re-election. His, his health was so bad, and he, he followed his doctor's advice. It wasn't two weeks after I took over out there that Judge Proctor passed away. The only thing that kept him going, I'm sure, the last year or two, was the fact that he had something to do one day a week when he went over and handled small claims and traffic arrangements and occasionally a, a driving under the influence of trial. Judge Crawford was quite an interesting fellow. He, he uh, took the bench in a sport coat, a sport, not a coat, a sport shirt, and he smoked on the bench. And the bench in the old, the old uh, church, congregational church out there, Scandis. The bench was not elevated, it was just a, a table. And here <laughs> Judge Crawford and me and the jury and everything, and his sport shirt, his ashtray, and his cigarette. And, but in those days, uh, they got by doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> so very briefly then, that brings us up to the as it was when I took over. Now I'm not going to, to go into anything about court business, but I, I, I thought I'd tell you just a couple of uh, stories about lawyers that I, over the years that I thought were kind of good. Two attorneys came out for a 502 for a drunk driving trial. And uh, the defense attorney, the fellow who was uh, defending the man charged with driving under the influence, was named Tom Collins, rather appropriate enough. <laughs> I don't know how many of you remember Tom. He was an awful nice young fellow. Bob Baker was the young deputy district attorney. It was their both. It was both of their first jury trial, and I was really happy that Tom won that case because I knew that. Bob, Bob's a fine attorney. I knew he'd win lots of cases, uh, prosecuting cases, but uh, to win your first case when you're on the defense side of an issue, I think means an awful lot, and that's what Tom did. He won that case, and I was always very pleased about that. Don't know what happened to Tom. I heard he, some many years ago, he went over to the Hawaiian Islands, and everybody kind of lost track of him. Duncan O'Neill. Duncan O'Neill was one of the most respected attorneys in our state, in our county, for many, many years. And he got a traffic ticket one time out there in our district. And his son, Louis, came in for the arraignment and he asked for a court trial. In those days, uh, all traffic tickets, all, all trials, the district attorney was present. Some deputy district attorney was present to present the people's case, which made it very nice, I thought, for the, for the judge. And uh, I understand that they haven't done that for quite a while, a lot of traffic, traffic cases. But anyway, I, call, I used to always call cases involving attorneys first. So I, I called the case of people against Duncan O'Neill, and the district attorney was there, and uh, I said, uh, Mr. District Attorney, you ready to proceed? And he called the name of the, the officer who had uh, issued the citation, and no answer. Well, that was a policy of mine. At the trial, if the officer didn't appear, the case was dismissed. I didn't require citizens to come out more than once for their trial. So I dismissed the case, and uh, Louis started to put his papers back into the briefcase, and I found this out afterwards. Louis told me some time later, and his dad, Duncan, said, don't I get to tell my story? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Louis said, sure, if you get another attorney. He closed his, he closed his case and walked out, his dad followed after him. Sometimes people really want to tell their, their own side of it. That reminds me, too, of uh, I.B. Padway. <laughs> I.B. Padway was the labor attorney. Maybe a few more. And 
that. John Claridge was elected at the same time I was. He was judge down in Gilroy. And uh, we took assignments to the San Jose Muni Court uh, quite often when they needed help. And uh, I found that I could not be a practicing attorney and a judge at the same time. Having a client come in with a ticket was something that I wasn't interested in fooling around with. So I, my partners and I set up to dissolve the partnership and uh, then I got assignments. I think uh, Joe Leofort mentioned the fact that he got assignments in other areas. Uh, Clarence and I were lucky enough, or at least I was lucky enough, to be assigned to the San Jose Muni Court. And Clarence would come up once in a while. He, he still had his practice down in Gilroy and he was able to maintain that. Well, I.B. Padway came in on a ticket before Judge Clarich. And uh, the district attorney put on his case. The officer showed up. But the officer didn't remember much about the incident and uh, didn't make a very convincing witness. So when the district attorney arrested, uh, Judge Clarich said, this case hasn't been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Mr. Padway was incensed. He insisted that the case be reopened so that he could tell his side of it. <laughs> so Judge Clarence obliged. Oh. And uh, I see what's coming. Mr. Most Padway took the stand to fill in all of the holes in the district attorney's case. <laughs> there was nothing that the, the judge could do but to find him guilty. <laughs> and if he bought them or not, but we had a fellow out in Los Gatos who was a drunk, poor guy, you know, you feel sorry for him. He lived with a lady, and I'm sure they weren't married, and in those days that was kind of unusual. The lady had a little old house in Campbell. Or I went out one time to look at the house, you know, after hours, because they were in there court so often. I just wanted to see what kind of a house that was and what went on out there at that house. So anyway, I'll call him Jerry and I'll call her Lillian because of their first names. I won't mention their last names. Jerry came down to court. I guess he was going to try to come in for the arraignment, but he'd been drinking. And talk about doors on the buses open up automatically when they're working. We had doors out there into the clerk's office in Las Gatos. They were nice big glass doors with metal rims around them. And they both pushed in, both pushed out. They go either way. Somehow, Jerry, in trying to get into the clerk's office, fell down and he got his head caught in those two doors. <laughs> and he was having a heck of a time. I think if it hadn't been stuck, he wouldn't have been able to get up. But this, <laughs> so the clerk comes running in, I think it was a recess that I had or something, he comes running back to the, to the chambers and said, Jerry got his head stuck. <laughs> so anyway, after pushing around a little bit with some help from some of the lawyers around there, we finally got Jerry out of that, that situation. And then, what I used to have to do, or I felt I had to do with, with these drunks who came in all the time, I had to give them some jail time so they could get dried out and have some good meals and get their strength back. And they would. They'd go over, they'd go uh, down to the jail and the ladies would go out to Elmwood and they would dry out and they'd have food and gee, when they were released maybe 30 days later, they felt pretty darn good and then they'd start all over again. Well, Jerry, Jerry one time was creating a real disturbance yeah. over at his house and the, the police went over and instead of just uh, arresting him as a, an ordinary drunk, they added a few other charges, disturbing the peace, and uh, I think he was a little obstreperous, so they put in resisting arrest. And anyway, the bail got up pretty high, and for those days, it was 500 bucks. And somehow, Jerry got Lillian's social security checks and some other stuff, I guess, and got 500 bucks together, <laughs> or no, 50 bucks. In those days, you could get a bail bond for 10%, right? And so I guess they only had to get $50, and so he was bailed out. Well, 
uh, it came time for his arraignment. He was, I saw the complaint there. I used to see him every, quite often, and I really was hoping one of these days he'd float out of town or something. So I called his case, and Jerry, well, Jerry was always pretty good about showing up, sometimes kind of drunk, but he was always pretty good about making his court appearances. But I called this day, and no, no Jerry. And I looked down, and the charges, as I say, were a little more serious than usual, and I saw the bail, $500 bail bond. And so I went to the bail bond. And uh, I was hoping that he had left the jurisdiction, you know, and we'd never see him again. So, uh, you remember Mr. Bertie, the bail bondsman? <laughs> he was the fellow that was on that bond. And you know, he, Jerry had fled the jurisdiction. He went back to Missouri somewhere from where, from where he came. And Mr. Bertie went all the way back there and brought Jerry out so he could get his bond uh, <laughs> exonerated. And so we, had, <laughs> we were faced with Jerry again. All the time I was out there, until, from 1959, well, I, I don't remember when Jerry first showed up, but it was just a couple of years after that, until, until the time I left in early 68, we used to see Jerry and William, and a few other old faithfuls. Okay, one more short one, and that's it. Brandon Miller. Brandon Miller was my favorite judge. I remember uh, I was elected in in November, and I didn't take office until January. And Brandon and a couple of other judges, too, invited me to sit on the bench with them in various types of situations, arraignments or trials or small claims. So I, uh, I took uh, Judge Miller up on it one day, and I was down there. And uh, I think it was an afternoon session, and we took the afternoon recess, and we were in his chambers discussing what had just taken place, and I was asking him a few questions. The phone rang. I was a disgruntled citizen. And uh, so Judge uh, Miller took the phone call. And it seems that this disgruntled citizen had been before Judge Miller on a small claim case the week before. And he had just received the decision in the mail. And the decision was adverse, adverse to this citizen. And this citizen wanted to make known to Judge Miller that he had voted for him at the last election and that he had actively supported him. And Judge Miller, you know, he didn't ever raise his voice much, but he said, don't you ever vote for me again. <laughs> That's it, folks. I'm sorry I don't have a little more time to tell you a few more. Seeing uh, our DA, Mr. Kennedy, here, along with Grant Armstrong from the Public Defender's Office and the Dean over here from Santa Clara Law School, talking about fair representation for your client. When I first started the practice of law, we didn't have public defenders and you did not have court-appointed attorneys. And there was a judge on the Superior Court, Judge James. And on occasions when uh, somebody who was really destitute would come into court without an attorney, Judge James would pick up the phone. He called Ed Nelson. Tom Ryan or Dave Lowe, all of us just getting underway in the practice of law, starving. And I had been in practice seven months, and Judge James called and said, I want you to represent this defendant who's charged with murder. Now, as Mr. Kennedy will tell you, when you prosecute a murder case, you get somebody that's had a lot more experience in the law than seven months, and the same can be said of the Public Defender's Office. But 
he had a way about him, and of course we all took those cases on. And fortunately, that first Murray case I had, there was an acquittal. And he called me back in about three months and said, you know, you did such a good job, I've got another one for you. Murray case. And I went over and pleaded, I said, Judge, you know, I, uh, I don't mind doing these, but it's, they're time consuming, and I, I, I don't have that kind of money. You know, I, I, I need some cases where money's involved. He said, well, you take the case, and I'll see if I can get the county to reimburse you something. Ah, okay. So I took the case. It went for 10 days, and I went over to see the judge. And he said, okay, I'm going to put in a voucher for you, and you ought to have something in about a week or so. And I did. $25. $25. Now, the reason I mention that is because I, I know the dean is very concerned about adequate representation for clients, especially with capital cases, and I know Kennedy is as well as Grant Armstrong. Uh, and nowadays, I guess every time there's a, a guilty verdict, capital case or any other serious felony case, the attorney is charged with misconduct, incompetency, you know, malpractice, uh, and that's regrettable. I, I'm not saying that I was the sharpest attorney after seven months, uh, but <coughs> there were other more capable attorneys at that time than myself, but they wanted money, and they wouldn't work unless they got paid, and I certainly don't blame them. Uh, before I introduce the last speaker, I told a story some time ago, and I think it's a nice story, not obscene, and some of you may have been at that gathering, I think Mark was, but it has to do with these two sisters that had never been married and had a distrust of all men, never had sex, and they were very, very concerned. You know, they'd be in a grocery store in the line waiting for the clerk to wait on them, and if a man got in front of them, they didn't want to get that close to even rub elbows, so they'd step back and let somebody else get in front of them. And that's the way it went. They were so extreme, they had a female cat they had never let out of the house. And they didn't let it out of the house because down the street in the corner was a tomcat and they were afraid that their little pet cat, you know, would have sex with that tomcat. So they would never, never let the cat out of the damn house. Well, be as it may, one of the sisters got married, went off on her honeymoon, had been gone about two weeks, and the sister never heard from her. And finally in the mail came a postcard from the married sister, still on her honeymoon. This is the one who distrusted men, who wouldn't let that little cat out of the house because she was afraid they were going to have sex with a tomcat down on the street. And she sent her sister at home a postcard. And this is what it said. This is all it said. Let the cat out of the house. <laughs> now, I think that's a good story. <laughs> maybe, you're not, maybe you're not getting it. Maybe this is all true. <laughs> Let the cat out of the house. Now, do I have to explain that? I guess so. Jesus, hey, come on, folks. <laughs> all right. That'll be the last one I'm going to tell. Okay. Judge Stone. Aha. Attended Flathead High School in Montana but then graduated after moving to Visalia, graduated from high school in 1941, attended Stanford for a year and a half, and entered the Army for 32 months, 28 months overseas, came back to Stanford in 46, graduated in 1947, and then law school graduating in 1951. He practiced law in San Francisco until 1965, appointed by Pat Brown to the Palo Alto Municipal Court in 1965, and he retired in January 1st of 1986. It's going.
on the subject of names, after what happened to my good friend Sam Leppery from Los from uh, Gilroy, I would like to point out one thing. Now, my career was relatively modest. As said, I was appointed by Pat Brown, who in the style of French kings, I've always referred to as Pat the Good. <laughs> the municipal court in 1965. Uh, Pat unfortunately lost an election two years later. Uh, thereafter, uh, I was exposed to a conspiracy between Governor Reagan and Governor Duke Majin. It turned out that I uh, did not have Jerry's 800 number for appointments, <laughs> so I retired 21 years later still on the municipal court. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I had been around. So when um, a couple of have retired, as noted, and about a year ago I called the court administration, I had a question, there was a pause, you could see somebody looking at the roster, and she says, Judge Scrover, what county are you from? <laughs> Someday I'm going to teach Nelson that the name is Scoia, not Scone, but... Uh, <laughs> Now, I must say, on as far as things are concerned in North County, uh, you probably have called the wrong witness. Uh, probably one of the best witnesses as to what went on in the early days uh, would be Bill Ingram, who was the fearless prosecutor who uh, uh, serviced uh, the courts in the days when they were, the courthouses were in Mountain View and Palo Alto, and can give you many uh, uh, enjoyable and some of them even repeatable stories of what life was like in those days. And the other is Stan Evans, who was a party to the uh, early uh, things of the North County Courthouse. I, of course, uh, put down my carpet bag in 1965, so most of what I'm going to tell you is either hearsay or on information or belief. <laughs> Go back a ways, though, and let's see where we were, and somebody out there is going to say, my God, I didn't know he was that old. Uh, in uh, September of 1941, I came up to attend Leland Stanford Junior University. There was a considerable upset because the tuition had been raised to $116 a quarter, and the cry was, if this keeps up, nothing but rich kids will be able to attend Stanford. The 116, by the way, you got all student activities, everything was free. Uh, we drove up and as we got off the what we call now the Monterey Highway, we went on the new bypass, which curved around the San Jose so you didn't have to come up the El Camino way. It was a uh, four-lane highway, not divided, and occasionally uh, places like where you were going to the county fair, you were stopped by the traffic lights and so forth. But generally it went up and the traffic wasn't too heavy. When you got to Palo Alto, uh, the main way to go was to stop at University Avenue where there was a traffic light and they even had a left turn uh, there. But those more adventures, some uh, driving along and there was a uh, road cutting off at a diagonal and a board sign that said Embarcadero Road. And if you were adventuresome, you made a quick left turn across the two oncoming lanes and went up there, and you drove happily through the carrot fields until you got just about to Middlefield Road, which in fact was true Middlefield Road, and then you arrived at Metropolitan Palo Alto. Metropolitan Palo Alto is a town of about 10,000, and if you wanted to, you could go down El Camino, which was two, sometimes four lanes, you could arrive at Mountain View, which had a population of about 8,000, and things were still as they were. Mountain View didn't speak to Palo Alto and vice versa, even <laughs> in those days. But the problem was getting there because you had to go through the orchards and the vineyards unless you went down El Camino. At Stanford, we soon learned that the local justice and police courts, Palo Alto had three sets of laws. There was laws for the uh, residents, there were laws for Stanford students, and there were laws for anybody who wasn't one of the above. The penalties were considerably different. I had a uh, friend who, uh, driving back from a happy evening at the Old Belts, uh, his lights failed. And you remember, some of you may remember, they used to have in construction lights, little, or sites, little fire pots that marked the thing, not these flashers. And being 
a carefree man. He took one and put one on each uh, fender and was driving happily down El Camino when, when the, he was bagged. Uh, he came up for arraignment and the Stanford student law was applied. If he'd been a resident, he would have gotten time served. Being a Stanford student, he got to work on the municipal woodpile. Now, the district attorney's office used to complain about a little something we ran in North County, you know, with the Good Works program. Uh, I mean, this, this let uh, first-time criminals who were stealing pens and so forth escape after doing 100 hours of community service work. <laughs> and so they put a stop to it. Well, the Palo Alto had the municipal woodpile. And the wood was provided to the needy when it was cold. And only people that worked on the wood pile were Stanford students. And it was very handy because there were only almost 4,000 Stanford students. And they all did something, so there were many people out there chopping wood. <laughs> of course, if the same thing had been done by the outsiders, they would have probably drawn 15 days in the county jail. So I went off to uh, liberate the world from the Japanese Empire, and when I returned, I found things had progressed a little. There was a police court, there was a Class A justice court, and Mountain View had, had uh, also a police court. Uh, the rules were about the same, except uh, the woodpile had been abolished, and Stanford students were actually fined. And some of them even were sent to jail. And of course came the court reform, which uh, Dusty has referred to. The incumbent uh, justice, a uh, fine lawyer, an otherwise good fellow, said that he did not intend to stand for a municipal court judge because all those stupid rules and regulations made it very difficult for him to run his court. You know, I, at the time I laughed, but he may have had something. So at any rate, uh, there is an election to fill it, and there are two candidates, uh, Judge Bowen, the police judge in Mountain View, and Judge Doyle, the police judge in uh, Palo Alto. And of course it was naturally assumed that Judge Doyle would be elected since even in that stage there were more Palo Altans than there were Mountain Viewians. Los Altos was a sort of a crosswords out there. The principal thing in Los Altos was Judge Meyer's big house and a lot and a few stores. And Los Altos Hills, of course, who'd ever heard of that. So uh, uh, for personal reasons, Judge, Boy Judge Doyle had to uh, withdraw before the election. Judge Bowen was elected and the, uh, uh, became the first judge. Uh, things progressed and grew, and eventually a second one uh, judge was called for, and Judge Paul Meyer Sr. was appointed at that time. Now, Judge Myers did, it is true, have a law office in Los Altos. I saw a great deal of him riding the train to San Francisco in the morning, so the commuter train, which I assumed he was going in to do research. But nevertheless, at least he stated that he was a Los Altos lawyer, so his carpet bag was smaller than others. And at any rate, he uh, was the second judge who was appointed. Uh, things that begun, then, then they began to change. There was uh, Stanford students had about the same. Some of the residents actually got put in jail for things. I must say that the, the whole time of this, Palo Alto had one crime in its entire history, and very few old timers know that, and that was the Lampson murder case, which had took place in the early 30s, and the director of the Stanford University Press allegedly bonked his wife uh, and was charged with it. There were something like three tri tri trials, three appeals. I think the second trial, and I forget it if you want to read it, is one of the greatest examples of judicial misconduct I've ever read. <laughs> and after the third trial, they declined to proceed further. Nevertheless, this was still the crime in Palo Alto, even the time that the uh, man stuck up the Western Union office on University Avenue didn't rank with that. Bud Hubbard was the uh, senior, uh, was the uh, supervisor for the North County, and uh, he looked at the situation and he said, this is not good. 
Now what had developed was the police courts had turned into two courtrooms. There was one in Mountain View, there was one in Palo Alto. Now there's no secret that Judge Bowen and Judge Myers did not see it eye to eye. <laughs> in fact, I don't think they saw eye to eye about anything. In fact, they didn't like each other. But it worked out very nicely because one of them would sit in Mountain View for six months and the other one would sit in Palo Alto. Well, the courtrooms were something else. They were both on the second story of the police station. They had uh, varying facilities. I tried a case in front of uh, Bowen and Mountain View, and as somebody has described it earlier, you were all on one level. Uh, the council table, you could help the clerk do the minutes, and he sat so close behind that he was practically looking over at your file. And there were benches and uh, which were uncomfortable. Palo Alto was about the same, except they had what passed for a jury box. Uh, Let's put it this way, there was more room here than there was in that jury box. Uh, the climate was fine, it was very cold in the winter, it was very hot in the summer. Uh, you sat there for hours, the acoustics were terrible, and of course you had police cars going, wow! Things you could hear, uh, the jail, the, the Old North County Jail, you had a jail downstairs in each one of them. And as the guy said, let me tell you further, jurors, the voice downstairs, you get your hands off me. <laughs> so uh, one of the great features was there was a chambers. They put up a petition. And that was the judge's chambers. The only trouble was that everybody in the court in the courtroom and probably in the police station down here and stairs could hear what was going on. And uh, if occasionally uh, uh, Judge Bowen, I remember one. Uh, said in a very loud voice, he's not going to try that stupid defense all afternoon in front of me, is he? Of course, everybody heard it. <laughs> I remember trying one case in Palo Alto where uh, Judge Myers was a stickler for propriety, and he said, you know, the way you're all perspiring, I would take let you take your ties off, except we don't do that in court. <laughs> so while these admirable conditions were going on, somebody and the county seat heard about this, probably Nelson, and set up a beach umbrella and said, that's the country club, and thereafter we have been known, as you all know, in Palo Alto, as the country club, and that's where it first came from. <laughs> so Hubbard uh, got the supervisors, got everybody going, and they decided to build a North County courthouse, they condemned down there along Grand Avenue a large tract of land, and many of you may not know that those houses along Grant are all county-owned still from the original condemnation, and they're uh, rented out. And the uh, reason for so much was they envisioned so much growth in the North County, they proposed eventually to have two courthouses, a total of 12 departments, uh, court uh, courtrooms, as well as the county offices. Just as well he tried one because the way things go, it well, there were some overruns, there were some delays, there were some problems, there were some things that didn't work, and things dragged on. In anticipation of this happy new courthouse, the legislature had approved a third judge. And, stand, and the law, I may say, in those days was if there was a new appointment, and it was not a fill by the time filing opened, then there was no appointment and it could be, it was filled only by election. So a governor had to be on the ball and get it filled. So Stan Evans was appointed something like uh, two days before the filing opened. <coughs> and they opened up one courtroom in the house and the workmen off and up so that he could be sworn in as a municipal court judge. And thereupon he was set to ride circuit. And for, I think it was something like about six to eight months, uh, Stan sat in Redwood City, he sat in Oakland, he sat in San Francisco, he may have even sat in San Jose, but he probably bought his golf shoes down there. <laughs> and at any rate, because there was no place for him. Then uh, Bud Hubbard was not running, and he wanted this uh, to be uh, 
dedicated, so again, still a rather unfinished thing. Uh, they had a dedication ceremony. Stan is still riding circuit somewhere. And uh, in May of 1962, in the North County Courthouse, was created. Now, those of you who follow the Superior Court have heard the long, sad story about the storefront on, uh, on California Avenue where the Superior Court was, but that's their problem, not mine. So the, uh, eventually the courthouse was put together with the three departments. Now, many of you may have wondered something about the strange numbering we had. Now, we've got deportment 408 or whatever it is. I don't know what's going on anymore. But you may remember my old home, Department 1. Next door, Sid Feinberg was in Department 3. <laughs> Judge Myers was upstairs in Department 2. And Judge Brenner was the first one in Department 4. Somebody says, how'd you get these things? Well, it was perfectly simple. Uh, Judge uh, Bowen and Judge Myers didn't communicate on too much. So uh, Judge Bowen, by right of seniority, said, was allowed the first pick, and he picked my old department one. And I was glad he did because he had a beautiful, uh, I guess the British would call it a cupboard, but a wardrobe with a sliding door and everything. And he was the only one that had it because the county ran out of money and nobody other department got it. They got hat trees. <coughs> well, Judge Myers didn't want to be next door, so he went upstairs for department two, and that left Judge Evans to move into department three. Finally, they are all assembled and that now having three judges, they must elect a presiding judge. And they solved it very simply. Uh, judge Myers and Judge Bowen, who couldn't agree with themselves, voted Judge Evans, and the first day on court, he became the presiding judge <laughs> of the uh, Palo Alto Mountain View Municipal Court. And from then on, things arrived. Uh, Feinberg, Another my local boy came down from the alcoholic beverage and put down his carpet bag in uh, 1964. I parked my carpet bag in 1965. And down the line, it was sort of, uh, there were people who made nasty references to whether uh, we were a branch of the San Francisco Muni Court. Uh, the line of some of the things that we've been talking about tonight, I personally have thought that those uh, early years in the Palo Alto court were certainly the most enjoyable things I've ever had. Unlike uh, the horror stories we've heard, the North County Courthouse was the last one that the county be built decently. Big, comfortable courtrooms, large chambers, uh, looks library facilities, it was the best. We had uh, I said Sid Feinberg, Jack Brenner, Bill Ingram, uh, people like that came along. It was one of the most happy, happiest groups we, we had, and I enjoyed it immensely. And uh, also, I think the, the lawyers that came through. Uh, I had a classmate named Donald Ladd, and Don went to work for the district attorney's office, and for a while, I guess he actually prosecuted. I know he was there the, uh, uh, my first year, mainly at Judge Meyer's request because he thought I'd be more comfortable since my idea of a criminal case was pleading my insurance adjuster on a deuce to uh, the adjustment. I often wonder what happened to Don because he went into the district attorney's office in 1966 and to my knowledge has never been seen since. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the memories were great. Um, I think many ways we may make too much of it. I came down from San Francisco where the civil bar, where to my mind, there were a few bad apples. You knew where they were. You avoided them. Everybody's word was his bondage. Uh, you were a band of brothers. I regret to say there weren't many sisters. And you... Uh, danced around in circles and the same with the court. I hope it was that way. I'm not sure it was, but I sure like to think so. So at any rate, uh, my only message uh, is that I stopped by the Palo Alto court the other day. I did say, who are these people? But that's something else. <laughs> and Ed, you'll be glad to know that they were all around the pool drinking cold drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Now, 
he's very so truthful too. Uh, we're about ready to conclude, and I just had a very short story to tell about Farmer Jones. <coughs> Farmer Jones was on the stand. He had brought suit for personal injuries. As a plaintiff, he was being cross-examined by the defense attorney, and the defense attorney said, "Now." Mr. Jones, isn't it the fact that at the scene of the accident you told the officer that you've ever felt better in all your life? He didn't answer. He said, Mr. Jones, you're suing here for personal injuries. I'm going to ask you once again, isn't it a fact that you told the officer at the scene of the accident that you never felt better in all your life? And Jones looks at the judge and he says, Judge, could, could I explain my story? I, you know, I want to answer that, but I'd like to give an explanation. The judge says, okay, go ahead. And Joan says, I live up on Mount Hamilton Range, and on Saturdays, I hook up my horse to the wagon, put my dog in the back, come down Allen Rock Avenue to the grocery store and get some groceries and go back up. On this particular Saturday, he said, this whippersnapper, driving down Allen Rock Avenue, ran into my wagon, throwing me one way, the dog the other, and the horse in the other direction. The highway patrolman came up, he looked at the horse, seriously hurt, broke the leg. So the patrolman goes over to the patrol car and gets his rifle and shoots the horse, act of mercy. He looks at the dog and the dog's all cut up in pain, so he takes the rifle and shoots the dog. You can see it coming, huh? He goes over to Farmer Jones, who was under the wagon, and Jones is just really a mess. I mean, he's bleeding all over it. And he looks up and he sees his big patrolman there with his rifle in his hand. And the right patrolman says, and how do you feel today? And he says, I've never felt better in all my life. <laughs> I, I just want to say, people have asked me, you know, they say, Judge, you've been at this for 32 and a half years, and, and you know, how, why don't you retire get off the bench? You know, after all these 32 years, I still enjoy what I'm doing. I really do. And over these 32 years, I've cultivated a lot of, a lot of friends members in the DA's office and the public defender's office and students out there at law school and police officers and attorneys. And it, it's been a great feeling because, you know, I'm not naive. There are some attorneys who don't like me. Uh, I practice law. And when I pass the judge on the sidewalk at lunch, Judge, how are you today? Nice to see you and have a good day. Oh, sure, you all say that. <laughs> you say that to me. <laughs> I know better. I know better. But at least I like to believe huh? that you're satisfied with my job as a judge. And my door is always open, and I tell people, look, I make a decision, uh, somebody's not going to be happy. Both sides can't win. You know, I make a decision and Terry's going to say, Judge, you know, hey, uh, I don't agree with you on that decision, but I think, I, you know, my client had a fair day in court. I'm satisfied. And those are the things that I like to hear. So uh, I've enjoyed my 32 years because of working with people such as you, you know. That's made my job so enjoyable, so enjoyable. Now, I know I speak on behalf of everyone here at the head table. We say, Paul, thank you very much for having us, and it's been a privilege and an honor. We're very thankful to have been here. Thank you all so very, very much. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank this panel. You said some good, really good stories, and especially uh, Judge Ed Nelson. If uh, For those who are still practicing, I would suggest if you want a quick and very loud plea, Go to Judge Nelson's department, because he is the quickest and loudest. <laughs> and uh, if you're going to get married, he's also good for that. He's known as marrying Sam around the municipal court. 
And uh, about 10 years ago, they put a plaque on the elevators in municipal court. You might want to read it. It's in honor of Judge Ed Nelson. They thought he was going to retire at that time, but he's gone much longer than they ever expected, and those elevators have stopped working since then. <laughs> and uh, we'd all also like to uh, welcome you to next Thursday's event at noon. Uh, Dean Ullman is going to have us to his university for the, uh, the Court of Historical Inquiry, Did San Jose Lynch an Innocent Man, which deals with the heart kidnapping. Thank you.